the next speaker is Professor S. Janakarajan. He is currently the President, South Asia Consortium for Interdisciplinary Water Resources Studies, SASI Waters, Space in Hyderabad. He was formerly a professor and director at the Madras Institute of Development Studies. When Professor Janakarajan came to Dakshin Chitra more than a month ago, he came because he hadn't visited Dakshin Chitra and when we invited him for the talk, he says, first I want to come and take a look at uh, the, the museum. So he uh, came with his daughter, they both, uh, you know, walked around the museum and he came back completely energized and said that this is the perfect place for me to really talk about sustainability because you have examples of vernacular architecture which really are designed based on climate and um, rainwater harvesting and how to uh, drain off excess water in the, care, in the case of Kerala houses and how to conserve water in the case of Chetinad houses. So he came back quite convinced that Dakshin Chitra is one of those places that he feels is very apt to take on the message of sus sustainability. And he also said that he would help us develop a climate and literacy program that we can then incorporate into our uh, educational activities over here. Um, so he says that the climate sensitive homes that we have at Dakshin Chitra are the perfect backdrop to educate children and adults. Um, Dr. Uh, Professor Janakarajan's current interests include urban water and urban floods. We're all seeing the images that are coming out of Bangalore and earlier out of Pakistan. Uh, his, his, the, his areas include urban water, urban floods, sea level rise, wetlands, climate change, and outreach. Professor Chakras. Good morning, um, everybody. Good morning, sir. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Anita for this uh, meticulous, uh, organi meticulous way of organizing this uh, seminar. Wonderful, wonderful to see all of you. And uh, I know how difficult it is to organize a meeting like this. I know how many days, weeks, and months labor involved in it. It is just not the question of inviting um, the speakers and also the audience. It's very difficult. I think she, does, she has done a wonderful job. Congratulations to Anita for this wonderful uh, you know, event, organizing this event. Um, I, before I start, I would like to let you know that uh, I stopped working on water for a very, for a very long time, at least now for 10, 15 years. I didn't enough work on water for three and a half, four decades. Now, working on water is not going to be of any use today because water is only one part of your biosphere and atmosphere and everything is now in bad shape. So you really have to talk about everything in integration with your biosphere and atmosphere. That is what I'm going to do. And probably my, the previous speaker, he started off with a story. I am also going to start off with a story. It's not a love story, sir. It's a, I don't know. It's a, it's a pathetic story. You know, there existed, usually people say five brothers existed. No, five sisters were there. Why only brothers? We'll talk about say, sisters. There were five sisters. And these five sisters were very generous. They were endowed with everything on earth. And all one, the only one mission in their life is to help the people. So they are even helping the people right and left. Everything they, they have is meant only for them because they got so much of property, so much of assets and, uh, and, and uh, which they have inherited. So they wanted to give to the people. They have been giving right and left. And they found pleasure in doing that. At some stage, I'm, 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 I'm uh, trying to close as fast as I can. At some stage, these sisters were themselves in deep trouble. They don't have enough even for meeting their own needs. They were all crying. They don't know what to do. Nobody was there to help. Nobody was there to help. Even then, people are approaching them for help. If they still try to help, but they could not. They are crying. You know who that? Who those sisters are? Five hmm? elements. What? Five elements. Five elements of what? Yes. Yes. That's our biosphere and atmosphere, and sun. And these are land, air, water, 
Agni, sun and ocean. And all of them are in deep trouble. And, and, and atmosphere, they are in deep trouble. Land is polluted, very badly damaged. Air is polluted, water is polluted, atmosphere is polluted, and sun is now reflecting very badly on us because there is no protection. And we complain about what? We complain about heat. We complain about heat waves. We will complain about uh, I mean, collapse of the biodiversity. We complain about floods, droughts. We complain about declining agricultural production, declining fertility of soil, everything, everything, all bad things. Tell me, is there anything which is really good today in our biosphere and atmosphere? Everything is bad. That is why this title. Our biosphere and water futures. So you talk about the water future in the context of what is happening in your biosphere. So following that, there are three phrases. No more to act. The idea of this meeting, which Anita has organized, is to know more. Not only to know more, but also not to neglect, no more neglect. No point in only knowing about it. Prabir made so much of a, you know, a speech, a big speech about the need for maintaining the water body and need to connect with the environment and ecology. So no more neglect, better connect with the ecology and environment. And finally, don't hide behind climate change. That's also a very important phrase. What does it mean? We, are, have, we have the tendency to commit all blunders and then resort to hiding behind climate change and for all our blunders. If there is a, see, you, you come across an urban flood, urban flood will occur if you do all, all kinds of structures everywhere in an unplanned manner. There is no urban planning, there is no proper scientific urban planning. Naturally, you will, you will come across flood. You will, you, will, you, will, you will all be living in an inundated area. That is inundation. Don't call it a flood. And then don't resort to hiding behind climate change. That's what we are doing. Just have to come across, just one hour's rainfall, your streets will be flooded, there will be a news item, climate change. So what to do? You have to pay for it. So this is hiding behind climate change. Let's not do that also. It's at the same time, let me tell you, climate change is not a fiction, it is happening. But then we have the tendency not to understand climate change, don't even know what is climate change, but then we coolly hide behind climate change for all our blunders. So that is the kind of introduction I would like to give. Now let me go to the substantive part of it. I don't know how many slides I can finish. I'll keep talking. Anita, when your time is up, you can let me know, I will conclude. Now this is our biosphere. I'll, I'll quickly go over it. You've got a land mass, you've got hydrosphere water, you've got atmosphere. Let's see how bad they are. And you see the every part of your lithosphere, which is basically land, every part of it, every part of our land, whether it is delta, whether it is a desert, or it's a hilly region, or it's a coastal region, or it is a, you know, a agriculture land, every part of our land is so badly damaged. I just want to give you one example. The Western Ghats today is considered the water tower of South India, Western Ghats. And the Himalaya is considered the water tower for South Asia. Do you know how badly they are damaged? What do you know about the Western Ghats? Three-fourths of the dense forest in Western Ghats were lost. As per the data given by a you know, very famous ecologist, um, what's his name, I forgot. And it's, it's a wonderful study he has done. And, uh, and uh, that, the loss of three-fourths of uh, you know, the dense forest in uh, uh, Western Ghats is really contributing to flood. And that's uh, anthropogenic. It is not natural. It, we, we are still working on creating more tourism uh, spaces in Western Ghats and more quarrying work, more uh, industries, housing, all kinds of things, and we're destroying the forest. How are you going to get rain? So this is only one part of the lithosphere. Every part of our lithosphere is now getting destroyed, and uh, that is where we are now going to pay a huge price in the district of Himalayas. It's too bad. If you're going to, if you, if you really watch whatever is going on in the Himalayan rivers, originating rivers, our river, rivers originating from Himalaya, you see there's a huge change in the, in the flow pattern. It's, it's, it's a seasonal pattern is completely destroyed and it's unseasonal. You wouldn't know when the water, the flood is going to come. That kind of a situation. 
and so the Himalayan ice melts, it's hugely taking place and all of them is going to make your Himalayan rivers no more perennial, they're going to become seasonal in, in a very, very near future. And this is our atmosphere. Our atmosphere is you now spread over six layers, uh, up to a distance of something like a 600 kilometers. This is the different layers of atmosphere. And we are, do we really respect our atmosphere? How many people know that our existence depends upon the existence of atmosphere? We take our atmosphere for granted, isn't it? Who gave you the atmosphere? This atmosphere is evolved over such a long period of time, millions and millions of years. And this is what is really making your living comfort, comfortable. And if this atmosphere doesn't exist, you won't have air to breathe. And these are the different layers of uh, uh, atmosphere. And mind you, these layers of atmosphere is really what making your life and living comfortable on planet Earth. You know how? Otherwise, the sunlight that comes, uh, that falls on uh, Earth, planet Earth, either, uh, either it will reflect back very fast, or some of it may not even come back, or UV rays will hit you very badly. Uh, so many things will happen. All these layers gives you excellent filtering mechanism so that you make your living really comfortable. But we are taking this atmosphere gra for granted. Let's not do that. And then hydrosphere. Hydrosphere is something extremely important, which, you know, this is a the theme of uh, uh, today's uh, seminar here in, in, in uh, Dakshin Chitra. And uh, how, do we, how do we really understand, how do we uh, really protect our hydrosphere, and what are the endowments that we have? Nobody bothers. 97.5% of the water that you have on planet Earth is in oceans. Where? It's all in oceans. 97.5%. Suppose you've got 100 liters of water on planet Earth, 97.5 liters of water is in oceans. You are left with how much? 2.5 liters. That's all you are left with, the fresh water. Is that water available to you? No. Of the 2.5 liters, 1.5 liters is in the form of glaciers. In the North Pole, South Pole, Iceland, Greenland, and so on, everywhere. So you are left with how much? One liter. Is that water available to you? Where is it? Half the liter, half of it lies below ground. Only half the liter lies over ground. That half liter that lies over ground, is it good? Polluted. And even the water that lies beneath the ground, underground, you are not sure whether it has got any kind of, uh, you know, um, uh, pollu pollutants. We don't know. So that is our state of uh, hydrosphere. So what is our basic in, uh, water statistics? Our per capita availability is now declining very, very, very rapidly. And, you know, we, 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 we are supposed to have something like I mean, this is a standard statistics you will get everywhere. You are supposed to get 4,000 cubic kilometers of water, which is 4,000 billion cubic meters, okay, in India. But it's a statistics which you have been saying for a very long time. It's a very old statistics. I'm not very sure about these statistics, whether we still have it, because the rainfall patterns have changed drastically. This is at least 20 year old statistics. Probably would know, but you are still quoting this information. And the total average annual flow per year for Indian rivers is estimated at 1,953 cubic kilometers. Again, old data. But the substantial changes have taken place in all this. Today, we really don't know how much we have, and our per capita water availability is one of the lowest compared to the rest of the world, many countries. Today, the estimated availability is something like 1,100 cubic meters per capita, and which is going to go down to something like 400 to 450, you know, in another 2025 time, which means very, very low, which means you are really going to struggle for water. So you are going to really live, you may you even live without water. That is the situation. But at the same time, friends, I must tell you, is there a decline in our rainfall? I have analyzed rainfall data of 150 years in India, in India and in Tamil Nadu. There is no decline in the rainfall. The rainfall remains the same. There is a fluctuation. There is only a fluctuation in the rainfall. 
There is no decline. But where is this water goes? Why should you suffer then? Your per capita water availability is declining very fast. The data given by the government is going to go, go down to something like 400, 500 cubic meters per, per capita in the another 20, 25 years time, which means we're going to struggle and you may, you may even live without water, but rainfall is not declining. Why should you suffer? Tell me. Isn't it illogical? So this is where you really have to no more and no more neglect. You really have to understand. These are all the messages you really take it to your constituencies. We'll talk about it further. Now, if you really look at the water scarcity and the demand and usage across the world, you will see where India is. India is in red. This is not my data. This is the estimate given by IWMI, International Water Management Institute. It's one of the UN-funded organizations. And they, they, they are projecting that this is what is going to be by 2020 is a matter of another three years. You are going to be in red. But rainfall is not declining. So look at Tamil Nadu. Tamil Nadu is actually one of the beautifully located states, including Pondicherry, one of the best endowed states in the country. You know why? Tamil Nadu is getting rainfall not only from what it gets from it, its own territory. Tamil Nadu has got the coastal length of 1,076 kilometers, second longest coast in the country. The first longest coast is Gujarat, 1,220 kilometers. Ours is 1,076 kilometers. What does it mean? It means it is, it is getting water not only that falls in its own territory, water, you also get water from water that falls in other states. You are, you got your own neighboring states. You got Kerala, you got Karnataka, you got Andhra Pradesh. Water is, you are also getting lots of water from other states. Just a best example today, the water for the past two months, Kaveri is overflowing. Kaveri is overflowing. On the one side you got a flood, other side of the, uh, the, this one you don't get water. It's dry. And water is about something like, uh, it went up to 2.2 lakhs cusacks, is what was released from you know, KR Sagar, came to Metur, and then we are letting it into the sea. Until today, you know how much water we have lost into the sea through Kaveri? 250 TMC feet of water. This is just a minimal, minimal estimate. And what is the capacity of the metro dam? 93 TMC feet, which means at least three times the capacity of the metro dam water we have let into the sea. And how much water you are supposed to get from uh, you know, Karnataka with all your disputes with the Karnataka? How much? 177 teams of it. You are letting into 250 teams of it of water into the sea. I'm not saying that you should not allow water to go into the sea. Water, sea should receive water, and that is what it will help to maintain your coastal ecosystem. Fully agree. But then what's your problem? Why is that you are not in a position to, you know, uh, save your water? Not only here, even, even in other parts of the state, including Pondicherry, in Chennai, water, you, you are abundant, you get abundant rainfall but you are not in a position to save water. And whenever there is a flood, what you will get is flood relief. Whenever there is a drought, you will also get drought relief. That's our politics. Then you complain about lack of water, no augmentation, you will do Kudimaramath activity, all kinds of maintenance activity, all kinds of uh, estimates you will prepare, project, uh, uh, what is it called? DPR, detailed project reports you will prepare. Spend money. ADB is ready to give you money. World Bank is ready to give you money. European Economic Community is give you, ready to give you money. Japanese government is willing to give money. German government is willing to give you money. Spend all the money, but still you will not get water. This is where you people have to know more and no more neglect. Take the message. So today we've got 17 river basins in Tamil Nadu. We, get, so we, are going, we, are going, we had supposed to get 17.5 billion cubic meters, and that is uh, 618 teams of water. I mean, I am only saying that there is so much of water, 
and there are 39,200 irrigation tanks, water bodies, um, and uh, millions of uh, you know tubes and wells. And uh, un unfortunately, our situation is really going from bad to worse. But you need to understand this in a context. What is the context? You don't look at your biosphere and atmosphere in isolation. You really have to look at what is going on in our country, in our economy. So the context is what is called competitive politics, competitive populism, competitive markets. These are three important issues we need to understand, isn't it? You really, market, the politics is so competitive. I don't want to really name the parties. Very, very competitive. And the markets are very competitive. And we are working on what is called development paradigms, growth and development. Growth, competitive growth. China is growing at 9%. Why, why should India lag behind? India should uh, grow at 11%. So the competitive growth, everywhere, everywhere competition. Meaning, you will make your economy a $5 trillion economy. Our chief minister will say, Terminal will make a $1 trillion economy. All kinds of, this is competition, reflection of competition. What does it mean? Every one of your economic activity that you do, however small that economic activity may be, you cannot do without interacting with the nature. Every bit of your economic activity is going to contribute to degradation of the nature. Whether it's the land, water, atmosphere, whatever it is. If you don't allow this nature to rejuvenate itself, then your growth is not going to be sustainable. That's what is called sustainable development. You really have to make it sustainable. We, I'm not against the development. I'm not against the growth. I want this development, growth and development be sustainable. If it is not sustainable, it's not good for the humanity. It's not good for the whole life system on Earth. That is why UN organization have come out with the 17 sustainable development goals. Who cares? Who cares about it? Nobody bothers about it. Nobody knows even what SDG is. How many people know about SDG? You ask among the politicians and all the, uh, all the development uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, champions. Nobody would, nobody would care about it. Now today we got a rapid urban expansion. Urban expansion is so rapid. Chennai is going to become, is going to introduce the third master plan very soon. Without really understanding what the, uh, you know, the um, blunders they made in the second master plan, they are expanding it. But it's only a matter of announcement. You expand it from 1,100 to 5,000 square kilometers, 6,000 kilometers. What will happen to the water body around? You are expanding it. What will happen to the water body that exists in this uh, expanded, uh, you know, the, the uh, urban area? You will eat away. It, nobody knows. And massive industrialization. Uncontrolled rural and urban migration. What is uncontrolled rural, rural urban migration? This, is, this migration is not spontaneous. Understand? People are committing, commuting from rural to urban area. People are commuting from Bihar, UP, Madhya Pradesh to, to Tamil Nadu. These are migrations. What kind of migrations are they? These are called distress-induced migration. I don't have my livelihoods there. I'm not able to end my livelihood. I'm suffering. Let me go wherever I can in order to end my livelihood. That is why it is called distress-induced migration. The enormous rise in demand for land and a fast diminishing urban space. Urban space is declining. Density of population is increasing. Most important, there's uncontrolled waste generation. We are generating waste in an uncontrolled fashion. You only have the policy. What is the policy? Do you know what our policies are? Not you and I, but generally people. People have the policy of use and throw. Correct? Use and throw. What is this? Oh, this is use and throw. You will go and buy in the supermarket. What is this? This is, in fact, the salesman will tell you, this is, this is use and throw. Use and throw. Who is there to catch it? You will use it. You will throw it. Who will catch it? This water bottle. Anita has put here. I told her, I don't, I'm, I don't approve it. This is use and throw bottle. I will drink the water and throw the bottle. Who will catch it? Do you know how many bottles we are discarding every minute in the world today? 2.5 million, this is an underestimate. 2.5 million water bottles are turned out every minute. You are turning out. Only 10% of it is re recycled, 90% is not recycled. Which means you are contributing to our bait, to the, for the degradation of the environment. And substantial part of it is uh, resting in the sea, goes to the sea. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the fish that you eat, 
whatever, it's all through, all with all kinds of microplastics. Anyway, let's not sideline that. So, the so most important, you've got uncontrolled waste generation, solid, liquid, smokes, and biomedical, e-waste, all kinds of waste. And growth and development is our, uh, you know, the mantra. And uh, given that, you know, our uh, biosphere, ecosystems, ecosystem services, and uh, whatever environment that we have are all in bad shape. That's all, uh, that's what we can call in, in one natural, natural capital. Our natural capital is declining, degrading. Some of the key natural resources, such as a forest, small water bodies, estuaries, brackish water lakes, creeks, mangroves, forest, groundwater, uh, groundwater and uh, you know, wetlands, and so on. And, and unfortunately, you know, each one of these natural resources that I just mentioned as a part of your uh, you know, lithosphere, the landmass, has got its own ecosystem function. How many people really care about it? You know, the best example I can tell you, 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 you invited Jayashree Venkates and she's going to talk about it tomorrow. She will talk about Pallika Nemash. She can't go without talking about Pallika Nemash. It's a wetland. It's a virginal length, of the, the area of the wetland. Pallike, have you all heard about Pallika Nemash land? Virginal size, area was 54 square kilometers. 54 square kilometers means 5,400 5, hectares multiplied by 2.417, you will get so many acres. That vast area of a wetland that we had and used to get a surplus water from something like a 217 water bodies upstream. All those surpluses of water, lakes, all this water will come and rest in the wetland about 100 years ago. Today, go and see, you know how much we are left with? 600 acres only, not hectares, 600 acres. The rest we have eaten away. We have eaten away by way of a constructing road. We call it IT Park. IT Park. Satibama University, you've got a global hospital, IIT Madhya Kailash. That's the border. You can imagine how and what exists in this border. There's only one wetland. You go and see near uh, Pulikat Lake, there's the Ennur wetland. And then you've got, you got Muttukad wetland. And then further you've got Marakanam, Pandicherry, and the, 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 the Thiruvarur, uh, Kadalur, Thiruvarur up to, you know, Kanyakumri, you've got a seas of wetlands. Unfortunately, we are losing all of them. Um, in Kerala, Kerala also is very, very well known for lots of wetlands. We are losing all of them. Wetland has got its own life system. Wetland has got its, very, its own importance, a very important uh, uh, in ecosystem. If, if our landmass existed, Pallikane landmass existed, Chennai would not suffer from water at all. That was giving not only uh, you know, um, uh, reproduction of the biodiversity and also recharged groundwater. Today we don't have anything. It is uh, polluted. It, it has, it has uh, occupied lots of uh, you know, garbage. The Greater Chennai Corporation has utilized 220 acres to dump their garbage for 20 years. We call it legacy waste. Anyway, so that is, that is the kind of uh, you know, um, uh, scenario that we have developed thanks to our growth and development. Absurdity. See, absurdity is, what is absurdity? Technology driven. Growth and development, and for whom to whom? This is what I, I, I always ask. We are driven by technology, but we should be driven by science, not technology. I just give you an example. Sea water desalination. Okay, sea water desal desalination is a technology, and that gives you good water to drink. Yes, but I don't want the technology because I get 1,400 millimeters of rainfall here. So much of water, I would put in effort to save water wherever I can and my drinking water problem should be over. Why do I need so much of uh, desalination plants at a huge cost and uh, 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 borrowing loan from ADB and World Bank? Why should I do that? This is technology driven development. Be careful. Don't you be, you should be driven by science. You should know what is really happening. It's not that you are just uh, uh, spending money on uh, converting sea water into desalination water. Let all the good water, say fresh water, to go into the sea. Take the sea water and then treat it and then drink it. You tell me, do you need this science? Or do, do you need this technology? In order to take uh, supply 100 million liters of water per day in Nemeli plant, you have to suck in at least. 1,000 to 1,500 million liters of sea water. The rest will be deposited back into the sea as a brine. And you not only suck sea water, but you suck billions of fly system. 
life system. Yeah, the eggs, uh, fish, all kinds of uh, uh, life that exists in the sea. Everything you suck and um, make them all dead and then deposit it back into the sea. What kind of a technology is this? Do you live in uh, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Bahrain to resort to a desalination plant? You get 1,400 millimeters of rainfall. Kuwait, they get 220 rain millimeters of rainfall. Why should you do that? So this is where you have to know more and no more neglect and spread the message. This is our, this is our, and this is how we are really contributing to the degradation of our hydrosphere and atmosphere. Now, UN World Water Development Report 2015 alerts the consequences of unsustainable growth, unsustainable development uh, pathways and governance failures have affected the quality and availability of water resources, compromising their capacity to generate and the social and economic benefits. Because you know, all that now you're going to do with all your developmental uh, activity, it is not going to be very helpful. UN organization has warned as, as early as 2015, but this is precisely the crux of the issue which needs to be seen in the context of growing consumerism in India, where the middle and upper middle class population constitute over 700 million. That is our danger. Today in India, of the total population of 1.4 by billion, middle and upper middle class population who are considered the demographic dividends for the country. The younger age and the upper middle class who can consume. You, when you consume more, your growth rate will go up. Your growth rate is driven by your consumerism. And you have got so many people to buy. 700 to 800 million people who are there to buy, they have the capacity to buy. And so your growth and development is driven, but at the cost of your ecology environment. So if I, if I go to a mall, I should be very careful how many shirts and how many trousers I should buy, and when I should buy, how many times in a year I should buy. What do you, what do you, what do I do with the, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the world ones? So the consumerism is bad. So, so uh, actually, you really, this is something which you really have to think about very, 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 very carefully. So, PM this context while addressing the fifth governing council meeting, uh, Niti Ayok said, goal to make India a five trillion dollar economy by 2024. Only one year left. Meaning we are going to struggle fast to increase our, uh, you know, the, the, the developmental activity. I'm nervous. I'm really, really nervous. What is going to happen to our hydrosphere, biosphere, lithosphere, and so on? Because you are going to discard all your waste there only. You don't have any plan. You don't have any, have anybody talked about, people have talked about waste management, sorry, business management, industrial management, water management, all that. Have anybody talked about waste management? Does this concept exist in this country? If you don't do, if you don't resort to, if you don't consider waste management as a very important activity, you will not survive. The waste is going to dominate you. The waste, you, you will get perished into the, into the waste. You better wake up. Now, these are the sustainable development goals. Uh, I don't know, I mean, you'll see the most of them are extremely important. And uh, for instance, with this SDG 6 is the clean water and sanitation. Please go through, you all have smartphones. Please go and see what this, uh, this SD, SDG 6 is. It, it talks about the clean water and sanitation. Today in India, 50 million people do not have access to adequate water, 50 million people. So this is a world statistics, it should have gone up now. Water scarcity affects more than 10, 40 percent of the global population. More than 40 percent of the global population is affected by lack of water. Each day, nearly 1,000 children die due to uh, preventi preventable waterborne diseases. Each, each day, 1,000 children die. This again, world statistics. 2.4 billion people worldwide do not have access to basic sanitation services. Don't have basic sanitation. 80% of the wastewater from human activity is discharged into their waterways without any pollution removal. Many thousands of birds and animals die every day due to lack of water, fodder, and food and heat. You only talk about human beings. Have we ever talked about our birds, animals, and other life systems? And you know something? We talk about biodiversity. You all know. Because of the prevalence and the existence of other life systems, you survive. It is not that human beings can survive in isolation without the survival of the other life systems. You, this life system is dying. Life systems are dying. Many birds, are, we have lost many animals. We have lost many, many microorganisms. We, have, we are losing everything. You won't get food. You won't get anything. 
So it is in your own interest you have to protect the other life systems, animals, birds and so on. So they are all dying for want of water. Climate action. You know, this is something very important. Is it the SDG 13? You know, if you look at the climate action, 1991, I attended the Kyoto Protocol in, 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 in a place called Kyoto in Japan. At that time, people were only talking about climate change and nothing else. Believe me, many people didn't know anything about climate change. They only talked about climate change, climate change, climate change. It was, a, it was like, you know, a mantra. Everybody was talking about it. Today, the words have changed. In the last 20, 25 years, look at the jargon, how they changed from climate change. It is a climate change, adaptation, mitigation, you know, the net zero emission, the climate resilience, climate crisis, climate refugees, climate emergency, climate catastrophe, climate collapse, and climate loss, climate campaign. Today we are also talking about climate justice. You see how the word phrases have changed over time. What does it mean? Which means the climate change has become a real, real issue which is going to affect our life systems. That's what it means. But then who cares? There's always, you know, uh, uh, global dialogue on climate change taking place through what's called COP, COP, Conference of Parties. Conference, so UN organized the meetings. It takes place every year. The last meeting was held in Glaxo. You all know it. And the next, I don't know, next meeting, where is it going to be? Every meeting it is going to be, it, it is discussed. The Paris meet in 2015 gave lots of hope. Unfortunately, it didn't get through. And uh, Trump uh, uh, refused to sign, and uh, now US has completely withdrawn. So they are not going to work on the net zero emission. Who is going to work on net zero emission? I don't want to go into the climate change issues. That's a very, very big issue. Now today, with all that, now what are we going to do? How we are going to really combat climate change is a big issue. Now the, this is the latest warning from IPCC. They say that without uh, more mitigation measures, global mean surface temperature might increase by 3.7% to 4.8 degrees Celsius by 21st century. That's going to be huge. So, 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 so IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, has given us a very clear warning. You really have to be careful about it, and if you don't, it's going to become very dangerous. And we have overused our nature, and natural capital is now declining. Warning. The so-called economic development, the greed for profit, comfort, and, uh, and luxury is uh, destroying our planet Earth and more rapidly than anticipated. It's not, I'm not saying this. This is said by IPCC. So what are we going to do? No, and then uh, SDG 14, life below water. C, you know how, what C is and how, how, how badly it is affected, how um, toxic it is becoming, how many water bottles, how many waste, that we are generating is all, you know, going, uh, uh, spoiling uh, the uh, sea water, life on land, we discussed already. And so the key issue here is that all the SDGs I talked about, 16, 13, 14, and 15, are all interwoven. They don't uh, act in isolation. So it is very, very important that uh, all these are, uh, you know, very closely interrelated. And please remember, these elements of biosphere do, do actually have very badly uh, um, uh, 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 affected. And they have very close interaction among them. And also play a very critical role in contributing to the lives and livelihoods of the people. But if you're going to lose them, your lives and livelihoods are going to be very badly affected. I talked about the atmosphere, six layers. This is what the scientists are predicting. There's going to be atmospheric collapse. By 2060, they are even suggesting the month of July, there is going to be atmospheric collapse. If these five, six layers of atmosphere, they collapse, you and I cannot su su survive. And this atmospheric collapse is going to become very, very serious. And, uh, and I don't know whether anybody is talking about it. And uh, uh, the, this, uh, this graph tells you that uh, how many Earths do we need for our survival today, given the fact that the given growth and development activity, if you want to follow the lifestyle that US and the Europe are following, you need 4.5 planets. The whole, whole world cannot follow that kind of a lifestyle. And if you follow the lifestyle that India has, you need only 0.7 planet. And if you follow the lifestyle that is uh, followed in major parts of Africa, East and West Africa, you need only 0.5 planet Earth. But then, the other parts of the world, they are enjoying a lot, and they, by well, that kind of, a, you, know, you know, the pleasure, and uh, the, the sources that people enjoy, 
you need four to five planet Earths. This is where we talk about the climate justice. Anyway, so there are very, very many fundamental questions in this context. You know, there are uh, many things I have to tell you, but unfortunately, I, I don't have the time. I've been given a red alert by Anita. So, uh, so the, I quickly, these are the water bodies that existed in uh, Chennai and the Peri Pe urban area. 3,600 water bodies, it's all put in GIS. Unfortunately, they are all missing. This is a given drainage system. See how closely they are interacting. The development have actually corrupt, corrupted that. So it is, a, it is completely sort of, uh, you know, um, uh, encroach, and that is why you come across flood. Lots of issues. And tanks and groundwater, as a, that's a mismatch. Tanks were, used to be the major source about uh, 40, 50 years ago. Today, it is on the bottom, rock bottom, and groundwater has become the bigger source. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, on the 22nd of March, we had the World Water Day. The theme of the World Water Day was how to make the invisible visible. What is invisible? Groundwater. Groundwater was, is in, invisible, they want to make it visible. But I'm, I, I gave a lecture in the Kalpakam power station. You know what? Groundwater was visible originally. You made it invisible, and you want to make it again visible. Who is responsible for it? This is what you need to think about. Just uh, giving you examples on uh, how to do that. The Kaveri Delta, again, is in a very bad shape, and we are, Kaveri Delta is sinking. These are all the land area you know, going in the sea. We have lost something like 4,500 acres in the Kaveri Delta into the sea because of the erosion and the sea level rise. And also, there is what is called um, uh, subsidence of delta because of the groundwater extraction, carbon, uh, hydrocarbon expo exploration, the delta e itself is sinking, and, uh, and uh, one district may disappear, may go under the sea after some time. And the pollution level is so high in, uh, in Kaveri. Look at this. This is Noyal, the Bhavani. This is, again, uh, you know, uh, Tirupur, um, dying bleaching industry, generating lots of effluent. All of them are contributing. This is Pallikane Marsh, so, so, such a bad shape. So uh, there, there, are, there are many things. This is a polar basin where the pollution load is so high. This is a well in polar basin full of water. You can't touch even a drop of water. It has got nothing but the tannery effluent water. So completely gone. So um, all that I'm trying to say here is that we are in a very bad shape. We have done lots of uh, damages to our ecology and environment. And uh, we give solutions also. What is the solution? Link the rivers. You'll be all right. Interlinking of rivers. In 2015, when Vajbhai, sorry, 2003, when Vajbhai was the Prime Minister, he said with, with 4.5 lakh crores or 5 lakh crores, we can link all the rivers in the country. But today, we have not done anything. You need another 50 lakh crores, but it is a bad science and bad economics. It's not going to help. Alternative to water scarcity is not to resort to ecological calamity and environmental disaster. Don't do that. All that you need is to look realistically what is existing, what you can preserve, what you can protect. And, uh, and, and uh, our mother earth is bleeding. This diagram will tell you. We will have to work together towards saving our earth. Thank you. I have to finish in a hurry. Thank you, uh, Professor Janakrajan, for that it's very sobering uh, but very comprehensive uh, idea of how to look at it in a, in a larger context to understand our micro uh, reality. Now we will, uh, if I could invite uh, Prabir and Professor Janakrajan here, we can actually uh, take questions. So myself, Malavika, I'm a student of uh, economics from Salamaris College. So first of all, I would like to appreciate you all for taking up this initiative because what young generation claims is that it is the generation gap uh, that is actually working here and uh, elderly people are not really worried about it because uh, you know right. okay so uh, i have got a, got like many questions i don't know put them i don't know how to put them into one but then uh, we were talking about technology is, uh, so do we mean to say that technology right now green technology is a scam that's one question. Like, uh, I hope that's uh, understandable. Is it too general? Please do specify it. No. Okay. And um, uh, in a broader sp perspective, how can the United Nations bring in a better mechanism to kind of uh, induce regional uh, development or regional balanced, regionally balanced development so that there is less rural urban migration? 
because what I understand from the uh, speech is that uh, because of the uncontrolled migration, we have to focus much on the uh, urbanized areas. The density over there is increasing, uh, and uh, uh, we are uh, working on what's what's already there. Like we are concentrating on that area. So how can we improve the rural areas so that there is lesser concentration in the urban areas? And uh, another question would be from this one. Uh, it is due to from what I understood is that. Uh, we don't ha water is going to the oceans because there is no space in the ground to for the water to go to the groundwater and replenish it. So isn't concretization and also this urbanization that's already uh, that's that's basically leading to this problem of flooding in Chennai and all other metropolitan areas. So how can we actually curb all these things? So first one would be how to focus on the urbanization, how to bring in an ideal level, and uh, what can you UN do with respect to this? Uh, this particular point and also uh, is technology a scam? Green, Green technology, technology a scam. Green technology. What's your name? Malavika. Malavika, you have opened up Pandora's box. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I need one full day to answer you. <laughs> anyway, I'll be as brief as I can. Please have a seat. You see, uh, first let's talk about the green technology. Okay. Green technology is not a bad idea. Okay. What is green technology? See, it all depends upon how you perceive a particular idea. So I can produce something, I can still call it a green technology. It very, very, you have to be very careful how you perceive. So basically, what is the idea of a green technology? Green te technology, the meaning of green technology is not to consider anything waste. You have to be part of what is called a circular economy. Okay. So, what I turn out as a waste should become a raw material for another industry. What they turn out should become raw material for another industry. Should, uh, unless it becomes part of a circular economy, then it is, it is ultimately something ca ca can come out as a waste. Yeah, that's a, that's a sludge. But you can't, every industry cannot turn out as a waste. Then if they've got a thousand uh, processing uh, going on in this country, every process will turn out a waste. That is not green. But then if you really perceive your green technology in this particular fashion, then it is green. But then many people don't do that. So like, you know, I tell you, for instance, uh, uh, somebody in, uh, who support this uh, seawater desalination, you know what they will tell you? I, we will use solar energy to produce desalinated water. Is that a green technology? No, it's, it's wrongly wrong conception. Wrong perception. I won't consider that a green technology. So it is very important how you perceive it. Secondly, you, your question was about uh, controlling the rural urban migration and uh, how, how, what to do that, why people are migrating and so on. People are migrating from rural to urban area because their livelihoods are very badly affected. See, 50 years ago, 60 years ago, we were not migrating. They were migrating only when they, were, they want to go for higher education purposes or medical needs and so on. Today, Everybody want to come out because their, their agricultural uh, uh, activity, occupation is not assured. They have to face lots of uncertainty. You never know when they are going to die, the, the output will be you know, uh, damaged due to flood or heavy rainfall or whether they will water at all. Water table has gone down so deep they are not in a position to pump water and uh, the inputs are not available in time. After putting in so much of effort, selling in the market is a huge problem. All kinds of problems. So they, they have to face lots of uncertainty. So they migrate. Not only that, the uh, landless agricultural laborers who constitute 18 to 20 percent of the agricultural population, they get job, what, two months, three months in a year. Do you think they should uh, starve for the rest of the year, for nine months? So their, their livelihoods are not assured. So they migrate. They migrate and do all kinds of activity. So if you want, if you want to arrest migration, you have to ensure their livelihoods. You have to ensure sustainable agricultural practices. Without doing that, we can't talk about uh, arresting the, see, the, the, the rural urban migration. What's the last one? Ah, surface runoff. Okay, so in fact, that's the point I also made. You get so much of rainfall. You gave the example of Chennai. I tell you, our rainfall now has, uh, ranges from 1,150 to 1,400 millimeters rainfall in three, four districts, including Chennai city. That's the range. That's a normal rainfall. 
During, during extraordinary years, you get up to 2,000 millimeters, 2,500 millimeters, okay. And uh, you are also right that we have created all kinds of, you know, impervious surface. All concretes everywhere. So that concrete, that, 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 that pervious surface, that, that kind of a, you know, a pervious surface you are losing, and finally what happens? The percolation is stopped. So today, surface runoff in Chennai is 90%. If there is a rainfall, suppose you get something like uh, 30 teams of water through rainfall in a particular year, 90% of it goes to the sea. Only 10% of it stays somewhere. Nobody knows where. You might ask, what do you do with so much of rainfall? Where can you store it? I told you, I showed you the graph, map, where there exists 3,600 to 4,000 water bodies around Chennai. You can easily save up to 70 to 80 teams of feet of water in all the water bodies. Easily. And Chennai city's requirement today is only one TMC feet per month. So for 12 months, we need 12 TMC. For the whole Chennai metropolitan area, you may need 25 TMC feet of water. But you can store 70 TMC, 80 TMC feet of water. If you deepen it even, seven, you, you, you can store even more. Even if there are three consecutive years, you can survive. But we are not doing that. We will complain, complain about the flood. 2015 was considered the flood of the century. 2016 was considered drought of the century. Isn't it a huge contradiction? How can that happen? How do we increase the, the percolation of rain into the, into the fields, into the, not, not the urban centers, but into all the land that, uh, that is around? Because the percolation is... is uh, I, yeah, uh, absolutely. The absolutely. It's a very good question. You know, this question is very important because today, groundwater is the, has emerged as the most important water source in the country. Because 80% of our drinking water comes from groundwater today. 90% of our drinking water, the industrial water comes from groundwater. 70 to 80% of agriculture need comes from groundwater. And groundwater has gone down very deep. There is a growing mismatch between extraction and recharge. What you recharge, is much less compared to what you extract. That is what is called a competitive deepening. You deepen your wall, my water goes away, therefore I deepen my wall. So there is a competitive deepening. And hydrologically, it is, you are ending up in a uh, very, very big disaster. Today, we have reached a stage where we have overexploited and we, are, we, have, we have also reached what is called depletion. Depletion is the stage where there is zero groundwater. There is no water at all. It's like emptying your deposit. Put your ATM card in the bank, in the, in the machine, you won't get money if you don't have the deposit. That's the situation we are reaching. And the next stage is desertification. The India is trending towards that. Unfortunately, the Haryana and Punjab states, which are considered the state with the five perennial rivers, is the largest user of groundwater in the country today. Can you imagine? Followed by Rajasthan, Gujarat, Madhya Pradesh, UP, Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, every state is extracting groundwater right and left. Now the question is how to redeem it. You have to deposit. Very simple. How to deposit? You have to really resort to what is called nature-based solutions. You have to protect all your wetlands. You have to protect wherever possible. You have to, you have to avoid you know, concrete structures. Maintain every one of your water bodies, small, big, kulam, kuttai, eri. You've got thousands and thousands. Every village has got 15, 16 kulams. There are hundreds and thousands of temple tanks besides Aries, lakes, all of them dry, but you will see a lot of water going in the sea, going into the through Kaveri. There are 912 tanks located, Aries located below Grand Anakat. All of them are dry, but you are letting water into the sea. What kind of water management is this? That is a problem. And most importantly, I've been saying in the recent times, I was supposed to be, I wrote this state water policy where I mentioned the most important intervention that we have to do today is we got lakhs of abandoned bore wells. If you reach a stretch of 500, 600 feet, 400 feet, you can't recharge groundwater through all your artificial mechanisms, through natural mechanisms. You have to do a, a, a pumping. You have to pump groundwater to that level, otherwise you can't recharge. There is a way. You got a, lakhs of abandoned bore wells, which are not in use. Make use of them. Convert them all scientifically into rainwater harvesting structure. When there is a huge rainfall, pump that water into the ground so that water table comes up. 
just to mention a few more things you are talking about green technology today actually what we see is that most of these governments suffer from a disease called projectitis they want to just do projects so it's not whether the project is needed or not they are getting funding from somewhere so they have to do the project and they will give a texture of sustainability green technology so one item may be green but the remaining 99% is not green so you have to be very wary about what is being projected and not be you know misled by that one component like one of the meeting in um, hyderabad organized by niti ayog we were we work on coastal issues as well the number of ports in india 187 don't do enough business as one port in singapore so why are we having so many uh, ports which is causing a problem of erosion and all that so i was showing how indian ports are functioning badly 20% efficiency and so on and just after me was a presenter from from new delhi he was talking about sagar mala project building 300 more ports and the moment he came people started laughing because they said you know he's just talked about the non viability of ports and he's going to talk about they're going to spend some 1 lakh crores or something on these ports and he was saying he showed sustainable development and all that so he showed roadways coming all along the coast and industrial development so the niti ayog advisor asked what is the sustainable development no we are going to train we are going to do skill development for all the people on the coast what kind of skill so they are they are going to make them into industrial workers said so that but they are all farmers they are fishermen they are not depending on your jobs they are self 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 employed and they can manage on their own no we will do we will give them skills you mean to say a 60 year old man will start learning electrification or something and do some job he is quite happy catching fish or doing farming or salt pan or whatever so he had no answer and slowly slowly the whole thing became such that he actually ran away he he became because he was using all these words of sustainability and green technology planting planting trees you remove the agricultural farms and you're going to plant trees all along to show that because you're going to make some roads and you have to show green tech, green things so you just show plant trees who is going to take care nobody knows so that that is about you have to be wary about green technology the second thing you mentioned was um, rural areas migration there cannot be anything from un you have to work locally in pondicherry what we have done pondicherry is under smart city okay so we started a parallel thing called smart bahur bahur is a rice bowl of pondicherry which is a village 16 km south on the kadlor border we said smart bahur why don't we talk about smart villages because if the village is smart so we worked on lot of issues you know like they are rich in agriculture so it could become agricultural tourism destination it has a beautiful lake bahur lake which is full of migratory birds so you can promote tourism and provide alternative livelihoods for people there so that the young people there can actually become uh, you know take up inter- become entrepreneurs and take up do business in bahur why should they uh, you know take a vehicle and come all the way to pondi to do some clerical job or run an auto you know why not they we train them and make them so we have started a parallel thing which is called smart bahur just to show that you talk about smart village as against a smart city because if the villages are smart and they can take care of the 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 area pondicherry will never fall short of food because they have enough to supply to pondicherry but if that gets destroyed and they migrate then we have to go to other places for our, our food requirements thirdly about the water bodies i don't know if you were there in my presentation we are creating that 85th water body which is a 20 acre land right on the coast in fact the water bodies which were created by the cholas we are not adding we are just making them disappear now the simple logic would be that if the population is growing and urbanization is happening and you stand on your balcony and you see the huge amount of water which is falling on the roads and draining into the sea i mean we should be ashamed of ourselves but we are seeing this water just flowing out into the sea and even spaces which were ponds which is actually the space for water now people have built around it and encroached upon it even in pondicherry you can see all these encroachments and during the rains because they will get inundated they put pumps and drain it out into the sewer line so this was space for water 
why did you encroach upon it? And now you are saying that the villain, that is the villain. Water is the villain. So we have to drive it out from here. So you drive it out. So the work that we are doing is rejuvenating. Uh, I mean, if the population increases, you actually should build more water bodies. In fact, this was told by a young kid in one of the consultation meetings. He said, why don't we make more water bodies so that we can have more water? So it is so simple. You know, if the population is growing, you make more water bodies. So we have to work actively in the local level. You cannot come and do something in, you know, in Andhra or in, in Gujarat, but in your area, through your college or your school, you can take up some water body and see how we can restore. So it's time for action. Awareness is time is over. We are long past it. You know, we have gone into a crisis state. Now it is action, results-based action, where we, see can, where we can see results. We see that it has changed. You have bought, brought a transformation from what it was a year ago and today. You should monitor that transformation. You have to involve people around it, the community, the schools. So time for serious action. So otherwise, the, the last story that I talked about, it is going in a, in a direction we can turn it around and bring back that water of love. Okay. Any next question? Yeah. Um, so good evening. I'm sorry, good afternoon, sir. So I'm from Stella Maris College, an economics student. My name is Yuga Priya. So one thing that I really liked is when you said we have to be driven by science and not technology. But, uh, you know, in the earlier times, like sir said, during the Chola Empire and all of that, I think the technology that they did was basically scientific. It was based on science. But this disintegration between the present technology and science, do you think is it because of the new concepts of global consumerism or capitalism or due to the fundamentals that is wrong in education system? So that's a confusion that I have. You don't have to be confused about it. I'm not, I'm not saying that all technologies are bad. See, technology is not a bad word. But all that I'm trying to say is that you should be driven by science. When I say you should be driven by science, take into account your sustainability. If you don't take about, take, you don't give priority to your sustainability, every activity should be a sustainable activity. You don't do it just for the sake of fulfillment of a particular wish today. Tomorrow, somebody has to be worried about it. What is it tomorrow? Tomorrow is a future generation. If you are going to, see for instance, groundwater, we are enjoying our groundwater so much you can't allow the groundwater, uh, the, the future generation to starve off of groundwater. They may not know even what the groundwater is if you're going to deplete entirely. So you've got technology to extract as much as you can. You've got a vertical bore, you've got a horizontal bore, you do all kinds of things. With one bore, you can suck water from uh, uh, groundwater that is available in one kilometer's distance. You've got technology. You can, you can dry up the entire uh, uh, subsurface. Uh, 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 hydrogeological will become uh, hydro hydrogeologically you can do anything it's possible with the technology but the future generation is going to be very badly affected so that is where you have to be very careful about it you know uh, uh, in fact uh, Prabir was saying also with regard to you know the Sagar Mala project and so on the important thing is you are driven by profit there that is what is really creating problem I tell you an example of you know, the biggest port that is going to come up in Chennai, in uh, you know um, a place called um, uh, what is it called? What is it? North of. In the north of north Chennai. Of Chennai yeah. yeah, there's a big. Uh, what is it? A place called? Adani port. Yeah. Adani port. Mm -hmm. Katapalli. In a Katapalli, that big port is coming. You know what? That port is going to become the world's second deepest port in the world. If you want to construct a deepest port in the world, you have to have objective conditions uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, available there. It should be conducive for you to use that kind of object condition, but you, it's a shallow sea. In a shallow sea, you cannot have a deepest port, which means you have to go one kilometer inside, construct all your dikes and all kinds of things, and then I mean, uh, take away all the sand, you know, put, put them all elsewhere, and then um, make everything, you know, uh, raise it, destroy the indoor wetland. You know, entire ecosystem will be completely distorted, but you will grow probably 1,000 or 2,000 trees, and you will say, I am making the area green. What is this? 
So this is where you have to be very careful about using your technology, what you need and what you don't need, okay? Whether the science is necessary or whether the technology is necessary or not. And, uh, and, and you really have to think about sustainability, future generation. This technology is actually uh, very necessary. You, but the whole thing is how you use this technology. For example, in our work, you know, the One School, One Pond project that we are doing, we are developing an app called Nir Nilay. So through that app, the students can see the location. If they see uh, different kinds of birds, animals, what kind, whatever biodiversity they see, what is the, how much of water is falling, all this information they can, inf uh, uh, you know, map it on their, um, and it will be all GIS based, which means that, you know, how much of water is falling, everything will be there. Now, we have departments, they are supposed to check the pollution levels of each of these ponds, but nothing happens. They don't have the manpower and they don't have the interest to do it. But if each student, each the students of the school which is taking up a pond, measure the, 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 the chemical parameters and the physical parameters and whatever parameters. And if it is in, a, in an app, it's going to the central server and everybody has that information. So the departments, for example, the pollution control people can use their data for showing that this is the kind of pollution level which is there. And in terms of rainfall, Actually, the rainfall in two villages, just one kilometer apart, is so much different, but we go on an average. So all this information can be used because of technology. So this Nirnale will help us, whatever is the biodiversity, the, qu the quantity, quality, everything can be checked. So we need technology. But the whole thing is what we are using it for. Is this information going to help us in better manage the, the water systems? Is it going to help us in better knowing what is around us? Then yes. But if you're using technologies for, you know, destructive purposes, then you have to be careful. We can take one more question, I think, Charles, for one more question and then. But I'd like to make one, one uh, comment also. He does, you, I think from Stella, you missed his earlier talk, is that correct? Okay, well, he gave a very informative talk on what communities can do and how individuals and students can engage communities to bring back the environment. And uh, he also talked about how they interface with the government. The government is not unapproachable. So if, if individuals have good ideas and they can, they can approach the government. We did a, a Coom campaign with INTAC quite a few years back. And we, at that point, this was in the early 80s, not a single sewage treatment plant was working in Madras. All the, all the sewage was going into the, to the Coom and the Adia. The pumping stations weren't working. So the pump, there were 84 pumping stations. They, if they don't work, the pumping stations have to take the sewage to the sewage treatment plants. So they were dumping everything into the riverways which is why our rivers are so polluted. But as individuals, as different organizations collaborating together, we, got, we went to the government. They put us on a committee. They brought in a twinning agreement with Severn Trent, which was the British uh, equivalent of PWD. And they taught our guys how to bring the sewage treatment plants back into to working order because they were clogged with this fine dust that we have in Madras. They gave prototypes for how to get the, the pumping stations to be effective and how to get those working. Now, it's not perfect. They've increased the, the sewage treatment plants. I just want to say that this, is a, this was a group of individuals who took a petition around to all the schools and colleges to get them signatures to say, we want the, the rivers cleaned. And that was presented to the government. The government took action and put us on a committee. And the result was that, that we have less sewage going into our rivers than we had before. So I'm just saying that there's a lot of individual action that can happen. You don't have to think, oh, I can't do anything because I'm just an individual. But you have to get a group of people together. You have to collaborate with, with different organizations. From Stella, have you looked at your campus? How, have, did you ever have any ponds on your campus? 
archives should they be brought back. Um, one of the reasons Madras floods is because it was a city of tanks and everybody filled up all those tanks. So that was one of the reasons that we have so much flooding and we don't have water. So I'm just saying that there are lots of things that individual students can do and you can do collectively as a class. That's all I wanted to say. She was talking about the, the government. If we go to government departments and ask for anything, it's a straightforward no. But because of the OSOP program, this, this was shown as the students are taking it up. So it was, it was in partnership with the education department. We managed to tie up with 10 government departments to support the OSOP program. So when they're taking up a pond, they need to put fish, they need to put plants around the trees. Where will they get that from? So the fisheries department came forward. We will tell you what kind of fish to put or you can do your own research and tell us and we will provide you with the fish. The forest department said, we will provide you with the whatever saplings you need because the students are supposed to plant trees uh, uh, depending on what kind of trees are good for that area. So we tied up with the pollution control, with Department of Science, Technology, Environment, with Public Works Department, with all over 10 departments who said we will support this OSOP. But if we go, they will not support, which means that if the students take it up, they can get a lot of support from the government. We can be facilitators because the students will not go and approach the government. We can only be facilitators. But if the students take it up, there is enough and more support which they can garner. If we go to the community and tell them, can you help us in restoring this, this pond? Uh, no, we are busy, whatever. But do you think they can say that when the students go and say that this is a pond that we have adopted, our school has adopted, and we would like to restore it and we need your help? They will have to come forward. In fact, all the programs that we did in schools, we had the community leaders coming and speaking, and every one of them said, that if the school is taking up this project, we will be fully behind it. This also helps the students to interact with the community and take up projects which they can work jointly on. And uh, that's also going to develop interpersonal skills for the students. So there is a lot of help. It's a question of a strategy of how you, how you approach the government, how you approach any problem for that matter. And if you're smart in putting, pitching it in the right way and taking the, in the right direction, there'll be acceptance. There'll be acceptance, there'll be support, overwhelming support, in fact. I think strategy is the right word. <laughs> yes. So I'm Hasina from Economics Department, Salamaris College. So I have a question that um, you told that uh, migration is just because they, don't, they lose their livelihood and uh, they don't have a proper life to live there. So basically, uh, we have an economy which is based on agriculture. Though we stand on industrialization, agriculture is like a backbone. We tell that 50% of the economy is contributed by agriculture. But um, we are losing our agriculture productivity just in sake we say lack of water and climatic changes. So instead of working on uh, water management or uh, doing all preventive measures in urban areas. Can't we do that in rural areas so that agriculture can be uh, revived and migration can be reduced? Like, it can it can be a circular flow, right? So why can't it start from rural areas? Because we have a lot of banks, Noyal, Bhavani, Kaveri, everywhere. But um, we are not using it properly, right? So can't we bring that measures in rural areas first and then we can bring it to urban areas so that we can reduce migration and then it will be a, you know, I mean, equit equitable development all over. So that's my question. They could have done a thousand, probably ten thousand smart villages, because what they are, the money, kind of money they are spending on smart cities, most of it is absolutely waste. It's not required. It's just redundant. They are just doing some showbiz. It's not going to make the people smart, and it's not going to make the city look smart at all. They should have invested more in the smart villages. And that is why the, I was talking to you about the Smart Bahur project. It's about seeing how we can support the, the rural areas. You are saying that agriculture is a big, um, you know, the biggest part of the economy. What do the farmers get? Have you ever thought of that? You, you talk in terms of economics, for whom? What about the economics of the farmer? Who is talking about why are there so many farmer suicides? 
so we are looking you know even when you talk about history you talk about history of the people in delhi you don't talk about the history of the fishermen if you see the history of the history through a fisherman's lens it is going to be quite different from uh, the people sitting in delhi and what we are go the kind of history we are reading so let's not say that economics because it's you know the big thing that the farmers are making that kind of money they're not they're in distress because now especially with the climate change and this different you know the the uh, suddenly too much of rain and too less of rain they are they are suffering so how can we provide alternative livelihoods why is that the, there's a whole uh, you know people have done a lot of research to see how will the farmers actually get benefited not through subsidies but there are different actions need to be taken but those are not being taken so we need to work on smart villages i am i'm totally i totally agree with you that we have to we have to work more on the farmers because uh, the cities they will survive they 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 are affluent but we need to develop more uh, you know alternative livelihood opportunities for the people in the villages rural areas all of them seem to be from department of economics i am also from department of economics <laughs> my thesis was on what was called interlinked agrarian markets okay that was my phd thesis theoretical work but still i f in fact my enlightenment came from that field work only because the a person an agriculturist a farmer when he engages in activity whether it is in a production activity or in employment activity or in marketing activity is always in distress i find him always in distress okay why is he in distress because of so many problems everywhere he has to really struggle until he gets his final output and it takes to it takes it to the market again he is in serious trouble everywhere he has got to face this kinds of interlinked interlinked agrarian uh, market interlinkages and their impacts now very important issue that you really have to understand here is your farmer when you when you re, when he engages in uh, agricultural activity he he should really be assured of his profit but he is not and in india agricultural activity is considered a residual activity even in the budget you allocate money for all other activity you know you know you know very well how the budget documents are presented as an economist you would know it's a residual money residual money is given to agriculture oh, this is for that is also not spent properly isn't it so unless you make agriculture a recognized a profitable activity unless the uncertainties are removed farmers you cannot i mean i mean uh, stop farmers migrating uh, from villages to urban area see when we were in deep trouble during covid times what were you doing were you buying our shirts and te television sets and motorbike and cars you were running to the supermarket to buy our food grains do you remember we were we were thinking oh what will happen if the, all these are going to run away we are worried about the food grains who produces those food grains farmers we never remember so you really have to acknowledge this fact that's the number one most important primary activity is farming activity give that status spend money accordingly and as i said make agriculture is for uh, farmers a smart farmer and a village a smart village and then only it is uh, you know uh, ready uh, moment so first off good afternoon to everyone on the panel so i actually have three questions uh, the first one is i'm a person who is convinced enough that the standoff in the siachen glacier is actually because of the water resources there so do you support this theory and do you believe there will be potential wars in the future which is based on water resources uh, my second question is i did a uh, so the standoff in siachen glacier between china and india i believe it is because of the siachen glacier the water resource that is there and it will probably uh, positive have a positive impact on china and its production so i believe that war is because of the water resource so do you support this theory and is there any potential wars that will happen in the future because of these uh, uh, the second question is i did some homework of uh, uh, sir rajendra singh who did this uh, project called percolation ponds in gopalapura in rajasthan where basically the ground water level increased by building these percolation 
upon. So do you think this will be a potential, uh, uh, I mean, the rural migration is increasing because of lack of water and resources. So do you think uh, enforcing these percolation ponds will give an answer to this uh, problem? And the last question is that uh, a lot of these missions like Jaljeevan mission or the Atal uh, Yojana and all that stuff are very promising on paper, but what about the execution? Like considering uh, out of 19 crore households, nine crore have received uh, uh, water connections now. So that looks promising, but do you think there is something more that should be done in terms of policy making in India? Is that China is trying to redirect the Brahmaputra River. Brahmaputra River actually starts in China. Now, the Brahmaputra River supplies 90% of the water to the northeastern states. So, however, India and China negotiate this, that will depend on the future relationships of India and China, besides, of course, the Kashmir issue. But the Brahmaputra River is a very critical river for India. And I know there's a lot of um, anxiety in the Northeast about it, among policymakers, among, among citizens. So we have to just wait and see. But it's all being mapped in the air so people know exactly what's happening. So I have no answer beyond that. No, generally water conflict will keep rising now because when there is shortage of water, already there is conflict between Tamil Nadu and, and Karnataka. So these conflicts will keep rising because when, when the moment there is shortage of water, on one side we have excess, now, excess because now they are leaving the Satnur water and all over, even in Pondicherry places are getting flooded. So this, this kind of water scarcity is bound to become more and more conflict situation in future. Um, the second question was? Ah, percolation ponds, see, the, the whole idea is that we have to capture this water, the water containers, which was allowing the water to slowly filter and go to the ground, have all disappeared. I mean, we've finished them. So, we have to have this uh, recharge of groundwater through percolation, through any means that we can think of in terms of allowing, holding this water. So, what we need is these containers which have which have disappeared and which we can recreate as many as possible um, to be able to hold this water and percolation pond is definitely one of the ways that we can we can do that and the third one was Jal Jeevan mission you know <coughs> they always come out with this uh, mission um, Pondicherry you know I'm one of the members of the Jal Jeevan mission committee but the focus is all on how you supply. Every Pondicherry is 100% covered. Every house has a tap water connection. But what is more, uh, and something which we have been asking for many years now, is to do a water audit. How much water we are receiving, how much we are using, how much is going waste, how much can we recycle. There is no audit, as a result of which, the water table keeps going down and we keep just complaining that, oh, okay, water is uh, becoming more scarce. Bahur, uh, rice bowl area, um, 650 feet below, it is salt water. So we just keep complaining. But unless we do a water audit, you know, we cannot come out with real figures as to what is happening, uh, happening to our water situation. So I think it's more about, um, you know, Everyone taking up this issue, because I'm sure most of you are not even thinking of where your water is coming from. We are just concerned about the tap to my glass. That's my awareness and consciousness about water. From where this water is coming, where this water is going, nobody knows. In Pondicherry rural areas, the municipality connects the drain to the closest water body because they don't want to spend money on STPs and so on. So just connect it to the closest uh, water body. So, and this Jaljivan mission, you are not talking about increasing the quantity of water because the population is increasing and you need additional amounts. You're just talking about how you can supply. So you're looking at one side of the, the thing and not on the... Uh, uh, so we had been asking that, can you not spend this money more money on the uh, you know rejuvenation of ponds and tanks but that is not in the agenda i mean though it is there on principle it is not in the agenda of the government to work on that because they want to work on those more on contracts and things where you know there's a lot of vested interest is there is one question from mcc i just, I I just sure. answer her sure. you know uh, this uh, china's thing 
I wouldn't completely agree that it is because of the Siachen uh, 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 you know, glaciers and so on. It's more political. More political, China has been aggressively following the strategy of uh, landmass acquisition everywhere, doing uh, all over the world they're doing. It's only part of it. They want to really climb bigger ownership on South Asia. So they have been capturing everywhere and they are doing that also. And second, uh, secondly, you know, with regard to the percolation and the rainwater harvesting, as, uh, as you know, Prabir was saying, you should try to hold water wherever possible. I am not saying that you should completely stop surface runoff. Okay. And as I said before, you got, uh, I mean, thousands of temple tanks, ponds, tanks, uh, water bodies and so on. Unless you save water, you know, it's not going to be very, very difficult for you to recharge groundwater. And these percolation ponds, you don't have to create one. I'm saying, you make use of the existing one. You don't even do that. Why do you want to create a new one? And your third one about the Jaljeeval Jal 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 mission, it is, uh, I was, uh, you know, uh, part of uh, some consultative meetings on this. Very sad. I should confess that government will declare that so many villages have been covered in through the Jaljeeval mission, okay? And they would have provided some taps here and there and so on without really knowing what the source of water is. Where is this water going to come from? No point in constructing your structures, your taps and so on. And so on record, you would say that so many villages have been covered. Covered for what? Nothing. Because there is no source of water. And you may have some drinking water wells here and there. It may dry up in two years, three years time after that. So it's very important for you to really handle the source. Source point is very important. You really have to make sure that the source is sustainable. Then think about supplying water. Sorry? I, I, yeah. I think there's one uh, question from MCC. They have requested for representation because all the other questions are from Stella Marcia. <laughs> Sir, good afternoon, sir. I am Sarvoshini from the Department of History, Madras Christian College. My question was that uh, we are talking about uh, consumer usage on water resources, but what about the water which are consumed in lots and uh, thousands of uh, liters uh, while we are uh, harnessing electricity for thermal, uh, for therm uh, through thermal power or hydraulic, en hydraulic energy, which can't be given back or which can't be used again? Sir, we are consuming uh, we are com we are consuming more thousands liters of water for hydraulic energy and thermal power plants. We are so apart from consumer, apart from uh, common common people, more energy more amount of water is consumed in those uh, harnessing those energies, thermal thermal or uh, hydraulic energies, sir. All right, one, one thing about high rises. Jaya Lalita brought in compulsory water harvesting. How many of you here have water harvesting in your house today? Raise your hands. Okay, a few of you do. Because the, the, after she brought it in and the government has changed, no one is enforcing water harvesting again. But that's a very critical thing. So in high rise, I mean, you, you might use more than you, than you uh, consume. I mean, you might consume more than you, than you get. But every little bit in water harvesting is very key. And so one, one has to make sure that it's still you know, valid in your house. I know my own house, if I don't redo my, my, uh, you know, the sand and the, and the, the ash part, that my, my water harvesting won't be effective. So it has to be maintained. Every system has to be maintained every year. Hydro energy, after power generation, water flows down the river. It is not waste. And similarly, thermal energy, when they use, it is also reused for some site of uh, you know, cooling purposes. So I, I wouldn't think it is a waste. But you know, the most important issue here is every industrial processing needs water, not only thermal and hydro. Every industrial processing, every activity needs water. Well, the issue is how you, re how, re how you really dispose of the waste that you generate. That is what we should be really worrying about. Particularly the textiles, the tanneries, and the chemical processing. They use quite a large quantity of water, but unfortunately the water is never recycled. Not only that they don't recycle, they pollute, they dump the polluted water into, into the streams and the rivers and pollute the water. That is why 
ది మేజర్ ట్రిబ్యూటరీస్ ఆఫ్ కావరి రివర్ నొయ్యల్ భవాని అమరావతి కొడగనార్ అండ్ ఆల్ ఆఫ్ దమ్ ఆర్ ఫిల్డ్ విత్ ద ఫిల్త్ అండ్ కలర్డ్ వాటర్ అండ్ ఫైనల్ ఇట్ కమ్స్ టు ది కావేరి రివర్ అండ్ దెర్ ఆర్ నైన్ థౌసండ్ నైన్ హండ్రెడ్ ఇండస్ట్రీస్ లొకేటెడ్ ఆన్ ఆల్ అలా ఇన్ ది కావేరీ బేజిన్ అండ్ ఆల్ ఆఫ్ దమ్ యూస్ కావేరీ వాటర్ డమ్ ది వేస్ట్ ఉంటుంది ది రివర్ దట్స్ వర్ కావేరీ వాటర్ ఇస్ పొల్యూటెడ్ సో దట్ ఈస్ ది ఇష్యూ దట్ వీ నీడ్ టు అటాక్ దట్స్ వెరీ వెరీ ఇంపార్టెంట్ ఐ ఐ జస్ట్ గివ్ యూ వన్ ఎగ్జాంపుల్ యూ నో దిస్ వాటర్ దిస్ ఇస్ అ టూ హండ్రెడ్ ఆర్ టూ హండ్రెడ్ ఫిఫ్టీ ఎంఎల్ వాటర్ ఆర్ టూ హండ్రెడ్ ఎంఎల్ వాటర్ ఐ డోంట్ హౌ మెనీ హౌ మెనీ మిలీ లీటర్స్ దిస్ వాటర్ ఇఫ్ యూ వాంట్ ఇఫ్ యూ డ్రింక్ ఇట్ అండ్ దెన్ నాట్ ఓన్లీ దట్ యూ త్రో ది బాటిల్ అవుట్ బట్ దెన్ టు క్రియేట్ టు టు రిట్రీట్ దిస్ మచ్ వాటర్ యూ హెట్ రియలీ దిస్ అట్లీస్ట్ వన్ అండ్ హాఫ్ లీటర్స్ ఆఫ్ వాటర్ యాజ్ అ వేస్ట్ దిస్ ఆర్ ఆల్ ద థింగ్స్ వీ షుడ్ బి రియలీ కన్సర్న్ అబౌట్ there are many things we can we can we can really look at so, but then no point in uh, issue looking at each one of these issues but you really have to think about every one of the industrial processing every one of the economic activity put it that way every one of the economic activity needs water and then you really attack how the used water i don't say waste water put it in quotes it's a used water it is also a water how the used water is reused and use your green technology there that is where you really become part of the circular economy thank you i think we can take the rest of the questions offline so a special thank you to our panelists probir and professor janakrajan thank you very much for taking the time and coming uh, to dakshin chitra museum today a very special thank you for an engaging uh, audience uh, students from mcc and stella maris and i hope you have a wonderful afternoon as well with two films and amudan uh, you know curating the films do have lunch if you have time walk around the campus and sort of get a sense of what dakshin chitra is and we'll meet here again at 2 pm thank you